Hi everyone, good morning. Um, as Lisa said, my name is Julie Dunbar and I'm the Technology Specialist here at the Assistive Technology Exchange Center, um, a program of Goodwill Orange County in Santa Ana, California. My email address is on this slide and then I'll also provide it to you at the end as well so that if you have questions following this training, you're welcome to email me or contact me. Just a little bit about myself before we get started. Um, I graduated from Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, with a bachelor's degree in speech, language, pathology, and audiology. And in between undergrad and grad school, I worked as a teacher's assistant at the Illinois Center for Autism. That's where I had my initial exposure to AAC and AT and became so interested in it that I started to um, research graduate schools in the country that would actually allow me to emphasize in AAC and AT. I found Purdue University in Indiana and earned my master's degree from there in special education. And actually, during my time there, did a two-year practicum providing AAC and AT services to children grades pre-K through 12th grade. Um, from there, I taught special education in the Chicago suburbs before becoming a regional consultant for um, an AAC device vendor. And I actually worked as a regional consultant for four and a half years prior to starting the position of technology specialist for ATEC. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. If we can go ahead and go to the next slide. This is just our agenda. We're going to talk about um, utilizing core vocabulary in AAC systems. Now, as we talk today, I'm really talking about any AAC system that's out there, low-tech, mid-tech, to high-tech. Um, when I was still teaching, you know, I had nine kids in my classroom, and every kiddo just about had a different AAC system. But we utilized core vocabulary in all of them. And I taught kiddos who were, uh, you know, classified as moderate to severe. So I had some kiddos who were pretty challenging and, and whose maybe goals were set pretty low. Um, and we still, we focused on core vocabulary in my classroom. So it's really kind of been what I've done over the span of my career so far. So we're going to talk a little bit about language development, more specifically about core vocabulary, and then get into some everyday situations and how you can make core vocabulary work in those situations. We'll talk about young kids' preschool age and then go all the way up through adulthood, just so you can kind of see the, the broad range and the span and how core vocabulary can really be essential to um, your life. Then I'll also go over some resources and we'll have time for questions too. It seems like it's a fairly small group today, so if you have questions as we go, please feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll, we can pause and uh, go ahead and go over the questions that you have. Okay, the next slide. Before we begin, we're going to set our expectations high. I'm one of those people that when I work with my clients, I presume competence. I don't assume incompetence. I really want to set realistic goals, yes, but my expectations are always high for the clients that I work with. This quote here, I feel like really expresses how I feel as well, and this is actually from someone who uses an AAC device. And it says, I know many parents and educators who are so happy to have their child be able to just express their needs. I think people who do this are doing a great disservice to their child because there's so much more to life and communication than just expressing needs. And I very much agree. Um, a lot of times we see devices that are set up with phrases for basic needs, such as I'm hungry, I need bathroom, etc. But communication is so much more than that that we need to move beyond just teaching kids or adults how to express their basic needs and that's all. Okay, next slide. So what does the research tell us about core vocabulary? Um, also, following this presentation, if you're someone who really would like some of this research, I'm happy to send you articles, happy to send you some core vocabulary words lists. There's quite a few out there. Um, so just send me an email or give me a call and let me know about that. 80% of the words we say on a daily basis comes from a list of about 200 words. 85 to 90% of the words we say comes from a list of 300 to 400 words. Kind of alarming when you think about it, that's really not a lot of words. But again, the bulk of the words that we say on a daily basis comes from this small bank. Um, again, you know, 200 to 400 words are 85 to 90 percent of the words that we say. Taking a look at the words that I have listed down here at the bottom. 
and I don't know, Lisa, do we have a way that people can um, do a check mark or raise their hand to answer? Yeah. Okay. People can uh, raise their hand or they have a yes no above their uh, above the main room. So we'll do the yes no and I'm just gonna ask everyone, has anyone said the name Dolly Parton in the last twenty four hours? No yeses so far. Not very surprising. That's about what I expected. What about has anyone said the word more in the last 24 hours? About what I expected there too. Has anyone said the word tornado in the last 24 hours? Now, when I made this PowerPoint presentation, it was before the events of this past week. So I put the word tornado on there, not intentionally at all. Um, tornado is actually a word that is called fringe vocabulary. It's not a word we use very often. But most of us have probably used it this week just because of the events that have occurred in Oklahoma. Looking at this list, the words that you see in red are words we don't use very often at all. The words that you see in green Words like go, more, get, see, and, like, run, is, and are, are core vocabulary words. Those are words we use fairly often and probably multiple times throughout our day. Go ahead and switch the slide, please. When we talk about core vocabulary words, not only are they the bulk of what we say on a daily basis, and that's not specific to gender, not specific to what we like to do, these four words across the board for all of us, all of us on this call, we use 85 to 90 percent of the day. Core vocabulary words are also multi-meaning words, which is what makes them so powerful. We can have a small vocabulary, but because the words can be used in a variety of ways and in a variety of settings, they can go a long way for us. So if we take a look at some of these here, the word go. I can use the word go to say make the car go. I can say go home or go outside, or I can say go away. Or if you take a look at the word up, and these are, you know, not all of the uses for that word, just a few that I'm mentioning here. Wake up, shut up, open up, put up. The word stop, stop that, make it stop. I want to stop, it's time to stop. The word turn is actually one of my favorite words to talk about. If you look it up in the dictionary, it has over a hundred different definitions for the use of the word turn. Five ways that I can think of that are fairly common to use it. Turn on or turn off. Turn around. Turn the page. Turn up or turn down. Or what we see commonly on AAC systems, especially for kids, my turn and your turn. Some other examples of core words that are multi-meaning. The word get. I can say get that. Get up get going. Or even the word back. I can say back up, go back, back off, take it back. Or how about the word make? Make that, make me, make use of. Or even the word more. Give me more, go more, more time. When I was working as a consultant for an AAC vendor, three of the words I would commonly start with when I was doing a consult with a kiddo and these were actually three words I would use when I was teaching as well, if I had a low-tech board, again, a mid-tech device or high-tech, are go more and stop. Reason being is I can make those three words work in just about any activity. So even if I have a child that's one of those kids that they're constantly changing their interests, so maybe they're playing with the screen at first, but then five minutes later, they want to play with the truck. And then a few minutes later, they're ready to go over to the sandbox or blow bubbles or whatever it might be. I can apply go more and stop to just about all of those situations. And that way I'm giving the kiddo, if I give them the word go and show them how to use it in more than just one setting, now they've got a word that they can use in a variety of situations rather than just one activity. So we're going to talk more about that. Next slide, please. So when we think about selecting vocabulary for an AAC system, 
unfortunately, there are quite a few AAC devices and AAC apps out there right now that really do focus on core vocabulary. So they're pretty set up for you. For the most part, all you have to do is tweak it to um, be the number of icons the kiddo needs or, or you know, the size the kiddo needs or whatever it might be. But even devices that maybe aren't formatted to focus on core vocabulary, for the most part, can be programmed or tweaked to focus on it. Um, so that's really a nice thing is, is we can make core vocabulary work for just about any AAC system that's out there, maybe even any of them. But core vocabulary, again, it's a small number of words, but we use them frequently. And it doesn't vary across settings, gender, age, etc. Across the board, we all use these words the bulk of our day. Fringe, or extended vocabulary, those tend to be mostly nouns. And depending on who you are and your interests and um, your vocabulary, that can be thousands of words. Those words aren't used as frequently, and they do change depending on the topic or setting. Again, my example from earlier, most of us have said the word tornado probably a few times this week because a tornado just happened in Oklahoma. But maybe a month ago, we hadn't said that word in quite some time because maybe we hadn't heard of any situations where tornadoes have occurred. So again, fringe or extended vocabulary can be thousands of words depending on the person. They're not used as frequently, and they do change depending on your topic. It's impossible to accurately predict what someone wants to say, especially when you're talking about fringe or extended vocabulary. If you guys think about the last time you went to dinner with someone, after you ordered your food and maybe talked about <clears throat> to your friend or your spouse or whoever it might be, about what you were ordering, we probably weren't really talking about the food much anymore. You were probably talking about lots of other things, maybe what happened at work that day, maybe what you were going to do over the weekend. Again, we can't predict what someone wants to say in that setting. So giving a child or adult just a page for them to order food doesn't get them very far. Yes, they can order food on their own and be independent, and that's important, but we want them to be able to communicate beyond that as well. Giving access to core vocabulary allows for novel utterances and communication across settings and environments, and that's really our goal here. One of my favorite stories to share, and it's a, a personal story that's very humbling, um, one of my second grade kiddos when I, my first year of teaching had a device called a text speak, and I don't know if any of you know what that is, but it's a mid-text device. It has paper overlays that you change. Um, we had a different page for every activity that he had across his day. So he had a calendar page, and he had a snack time page, and so on. We had some core vocabulary words on there, but for the most part, we did have a lot of topic-specific words on there. And he really didn't use it. He used it for basic needs and wants, but again, as we said earlier, we wanted to get him beyond that point um, and using more across settings and, and actually communicating beyond just basic needs and wants. So he started trialing a device that was really set up to focus on core vocabulary. And this particular child um, was a kiddo who spent a fourth of his day with me, and the rest of the day he was actually in the general education second grade classroom. And he started having pretty significant behavior problems. And over time, we couldn't really figure out where these behaviors were coming from, um, what was bothering him. We tried lots of different things. We analyzed the behavior, and we just were still at a loss. So as time went on, we started to notice that he really seemed to like shoes. He would point at people's shoes. He would tug at their shoelaces. He would, you know, if you didn't pay attention or talk about the shoes, he would start to pull your hair or bite you. So we thought, okay, maybe he just really has a shoe fetish. And I can appreciate that. So on his device, in the same spot on every overlay he had, we put something about shoes. I like your shoes. Where did you get your shoes? Your shoes are cool, so on. Still didn't use it, and, and it really didn't seem like he was utilizing any of those phrases at all. But once we shifted our focus and started focusing on the device that had the core vocabulary, um, over time he was pretty—he was doing pretty well. Behaviors were still continuing. We were still trying to figure out what was going on. Probably two months had gone by, and I was helping a little girl tie her shoes. We were teaching her how to tie her shoes. And he came running over with his device and said, I do, I do, and pointed at her shoelaces. It was then that it finally dawned on myself and the speech pathologist 
that he only wore loafers and pull-on shoes to school, while most of his friends had tennis shoes with laces. And that's what he wanted. He wanted to have the same shoes as his friends and his peers. We told mom that we thought that might be what it was. She took him shopping that evening. Behavior stopped. But again, we did our best with trying to predict what he wanted to say, and we were completely missing the picture. We were way off base, um, giving him access to core vocabulary and teaching him how to use those words gave him what he needed to be able to communicate what it was he really wanted. So it was a very humbling moment. Now, part of the reason that sometimes core vocabulary seems hard for us to focus on is we tend to like nouns more. The reason we tend to work like nouns more is they're easier to put a picture with. It's much easier to represent the word apple than it is to represent the word that. It's much easier to represent the word book than it is to represent the word go. But again, we need access to core vocabulary to be able to teach these things. The nice thing, there's so many symbol sets out there now that do allow you to focus on the core vocabulary, and you don't have to be the ones to figure out what symbol to use because it's been done for you. So don't let that detour you from um, using core vocabulary. It's not that nouns aren't important. We know that kids learn nouns very early on. It's just sometimes we can get stuck there. And then we have kids who can label everything, or I've met adults who can label you know, everything in the environment around them. But if you ask them what they're doing this weekend, they don't really have anything to say. But they can tell you an apple is an apple and a book is a book. Or I've had kids that can do that too. I can hold up an apple and say, what's this? And they can tell me apple. I can hold up a book. They can say, well, I can say what's this, and they can tell me it's a book. But if I ask them if they like apples or if they like to read, they can't tell me that. Or if I say, what do you do with an apple? They can't necessarily tell me I eat it or I don't eat it because they don't like them. Or even with the book, I've had a kid actually tell me I don't read because he didn't like to read. We want them to be able to say those things and not just label items. So as we go through today, please don't think that I'm not um, understanding how important nouns are. They are, and we know, again, that kids learn nouns very early on. But we really need to be focusing on teaching core vocabulary as well. OK, next slide, please. This is a pretty famous study. You guys may already know about it. If not, again, this is one of the articles that I can send you. But this is a study that was done back in 2003. And this study recorded language samples of toddlers in an early intervention classroom. And what was found is the words that you're seeing on the screen here, so about 23 words, made up 96, over 96% of the words these toddlers were using um, in that environment. And if you take a look at the list here, there's not a single noun on it. We have words like I, want, of course we have mine, that, what, in, more, some, help, all done, etc. So there aren't any nouns on this list. And again, it made up 96% of the words these kids were saying on a daily basis. So this emphasizing more the importance of core vocabulary. Next slide, please. This is a statement from the ASHA website, and I just always like to include this. Um, communication is based on the use of the individual words of our language. True communication is spontaneous and novel. Therefore, communication systems cannot be based significantly on pre-stored sentences. Communication requires access to a vocabulary of individual words suitable to our needs that are multiple and subject to change. These words must be selected to form the sentences that we wish to say. So again, just emphasizing that um, single words, teaching single words, is much better than giving a student or an adult pre-stored messages. The AAC Institute, and we're going to talk more about them later um, in case you guys don't know anything about them, but they did a study analyzing the language used by effective communicators. So mostly adults, they did this by um, data logging on their AAC system. So they actually tracked the data for, or the words that they were using through a language sample. The study found that 90 to 95 percent of the time, these individuals were using core vocabulary and they were using single words to compose their messages. 
So they were putting single words together. So instead of having one button that says, I want to eat now, they did, I want to eat now. So they were using single words to compose their messages 90 to 95% of the time. Approximately 5 to 10% of the time, they were using extended or fringe vocabulary, so mostly nouns, um, in addition to the single words in the core vocabulary. And then less than 3% of the time, they were using pre-stored messages or phrases. So they were really being novel communicators. And when I say effective communicator, I'm not necessarily saying an adult who can, who can put words together the way that you and I do. They may still be putting, you know, they might not be grammatically correct, but they're still getting their point across and they're doing it with core vocabulary and with single words. So that's something to consider as well. You should really be careful with how many pre-stored messages you give someone. Because if, you know, you have one button that says, I want to go to the bathroom, they've said a whole sentence, but they may not realize want is its own word, I is its own word, bathroom is its own word. And we don't know if they're going to be able to use bathroom. To, we don't know if they're going to be able to say go bathroom instead of that one button. So we don't just want to give pre-stored messages. Now, for things that someone says fairly often, for example, if I used an AAC device, I would probably want one button that said, my name is Julie, I work for ATEC. Things like that are okay. Some pre-stored messages are fine, but we do really want to focus on single words so that these individuals can use single words, combine them with other single words to mean different things. And that's when we can give them a small vocabulary and they can still communicate in cross environments. Think about the way kids learn to talk. They don't come out saying full sentences. They start with one word and then by about the time they have 50 words, then they start using two word utterances, typically. So we really want to think about that when we're working with people. Even if I meet a child who is nine years old and has never had an AAC system, we start with single words because we want to start where they're at and have that system grow with them. Next slide, please. This is just a little bit about typical language development and the number of words that kids typically have given um, how old they are. So by about 18 months, they may have somewhere between 5 and 20 words. And obviously, we know every child is different in terms of development. So this is really just an average. By about 2 years old, they've got 150 to 300 words. And then by about 3 years old, it grows pretty dramatically. And they've got about 1,000 words. I've had times um, when I was teaching and as a, a consultant for a device vendor, when the teacher or someone will tell me, you know, he's nine, but his vocabulary is really at that level of a three-year-old. And I think, great, he's got about a thousand words. That's fantastic. We can work with that. Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. This is typical language development here. When we talk about talking to learn versus learning to talk, a lot of times um, kids using AAC are sent to school, or maybe they don't even have an AAC system, and they're thrown into the world of academics right away. A typically developing child has acquired the majority of core vocabulary words he or she will need by about the first grade level. However, children using AAC, again, are often sent on to school, preschool, kindergarten, etc., with a very limited vocabulary or with pre-stored messages. And as we know, by the time a typically de child, developing child is three, he or she already has a vocabulary of close to a thousand words. So children entering school need to be able to talk first before they can learn, rather than the other way around. We can't send them to school expecting them to start learning the academic material and then learn to talk. If they don't have that foundation of language before academics are started, we may not have a lot of academic success for these kids. Language precedes academics. So if we focus on the language development, the academics will follow. Next slide, please. Oh, um, I'm sorry, Lisa. It should actually be the first 100 words document, if we can have that. And this is something that you may have already received, and if not, we'll definitely get it to you. But this is a language sample um, compiled from various resources, and it's the first 100 words of a typically developing child. 
give us one second and we'll get it out for you. Did it load? That's the Dolch list that's oh, showing right now. Oh, I know now. what you want. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I had these links through my PowerPoint there we documents, go. and Lisa was kind enough to put them out so it would work here. Um, so these are common first 100 words, and you can see we've got some social function words such as more, please, thank you, uh, hello, bye bye. We have some location words, so prepositions, in, on, up, out, here, there. Some descriptive words, big and little, hot and cold, loud and quiet. Early pronouns, of course, mine comes up in I. Me, you, it. Common action words, so quite a few verbs here as well. And when you think about, you know, again, people using AAC, how often are these the words that we focus on putting on communication boards or on AAC systems? But these are really the words that we should be teaching because they go a long way. Okay, next slide. So communicative functions. Now this is another thing I've seen a lot um, throughout my career. Kids who can request like crazy. They can tell me I want, I want, I want, I want. But they can't tell me I don't want. They can't tell me I like. They can't say I don't like. And there's so much more than to communication than just requesting objects. You know, some other functions of communication can be naming. You know, again, we know that kids start labeling items and naming people pretty early on. Commenting. So telling me they like things, saying things such as that's awesome, requesting objects, requesting information. You know, how often do we um, forget that kids or adults using AAC have questions about things, so no one's ever taught them how to ask questions. So they need to be able to say, what's that? Why? Not that we really want to teach them that, because we'll ask us that all the time. But again, it's, it's something they should be able to do. Two-year-olds are constantly saying, why? Why? What's that? We want to give that same right to people using AAC. Responding to questions. We want them to be able to respond back to us when we ask them something. Protesting or rejecting. You know, again, that's something they should be able to do. I don't want that. Stop it. No. And greeting. And if we look at, um, this is a, a pragmatics chart. There's actually quite a few of these language development charts um, focusing on people with AAC that are used and that are put together on the AAC language lab. And I'm going to talk about that more when we get to resources. But these slides are really nice because it takes stages of language development, breaks it down by each stage, and kind of tells you what should be happening within that stage. And if we go to the next slide, this is just going to be a little bit more of a blown up portion of the left side of that chart. You take a look at stage one, right on the left side here, and you look at the communicative intent. The, I, the things I just named, the functions of naming, commenting, requesting objects, requesting info, responding, protesting, etc., all come up very early on in language development. And again, I meet so many people who have had their AAC systems for years that aren't doing half of these things. They can request basic needs and wants. They can name. And that's about it. We want them to be able to do more than that. I want kids and adults using AAC to be able to do all of these things and want them to be able to do it as early on as they can. So when I'm implementing a device, I don't just focus on requesting. A lot of times we start there because it's easiest, and I can certainly appreciate that. But let's move past that point and move past it quickly. You know, I've sabotaged the environment several times with kids who can tell me I want m and M with trying to give them broccoli or something they don't like, and they get pretty upset and frustrated, but they learn, I don't want pretty quickly. Or I've done where, you know, you have those kids who aren't using pronouns yet, and they just say, want cookie, and I'll eat it. And they learn pretty quick how to say, I want the cookie, versus just want cookie. So there's lots of things we can do with sabotaging the environment to teach some of these things. I should have mentioned at the beginning of this, too, we're really only covering the very basics today. Um, I used to teach an implementation class such as this that ranged anywhere, depending on what the group wanted, three to six hours. So we're barely scratching the surface. So again, if you want more information or need more resources or materials,
please let me know and I'm happy to send you anything that I have. These charts are very valuable. Um, I, again, will send these to you guys or get to Lisa to send to you guys because um, there's a few available. There's one that focuses on pragmatics. There's one that focuses on sentence type. Um, there's quite a few that I'll send you. They're really nice resources to have. Okay, next slide, please. So let me pause there before we go into the next part of this. Are there any questions so far? Okay, if there is, please go ahead and just type it in and we'll make sure we get that answer for you. So when we talk about literacy and core vocabulary, earlier I said language precedes academics. Part of the reason we also want to focus on core vocabulary is it's so important to literacy development. And if kids can't read or adults can't read, they're going to have a much harder time getting through school and doing some other things in life. And I'm one of those people, I teach reading no matter what the diagnosis, what the label, whatever it might be, we're going to start where the kiddo's at and have it grow with them. It's shocking, but less than 10% of individuals who use an AAC system will read beyond the second grade level. And oftentimes it's because they're just not taught how to. A lot of times it's because we don't know how to. If we're focusing on core vocabulary words, that will come. And again, there's quite a few resources out there now that focus on teaching individuals using AAC how to read. So if you need those, let me know. If you think about most sight word lists that are used in schools, most of them are made up of core vocabulary words. Here's two examples here. I'm sure most of us have heard of the Dolch word list or the Fry word list. These are two word lists that are commonly used in reading programs um, in school environments. And again, we're going to take a look at the Dolch word list. And you'll see that a good majority of the words that are on that list are core vocabulary words. Lisa, if you wouldn't mind the Dolch word list, please. I know it's a little bit tough to see. I'll just read a few of the things that are on here. Um, but words like away, big, come, down, hour, want, read, myself. Um, you know, and then there's some nouns on the list too, because again, we know kids learn nouns early on. This list that's showing here is the full Dolch, Dolch word list. So it breaks it down by the various lists. It's about 224 words all core vocabulary words, and then 95 nouns. This I just got. You can do a basic internet search for Dolch word list. It's a free resource that's out there. OK, next slide, please. So now that we've kind of covered what core vocabulary is and why it's so important, let's start talking about some everyday situations that come up for kids and adults and take a look at how we can be using core vocabulary. Because that's one thing that I found um, a lot when I was doing my trainings as a consultant, is it's not that teachers or parents didn't want to focus on core vocabulary. They just had a hard time shifting their focus from nouns because they, they had never really had that explained to them before. Once it's explained, people usually get it because they'll take a look at the, their own words that they're saying. And they'll say, yeah, you're right, I do use core vocabulary words the bulk of my day or in my sentences. You know, if I say the phrase, I went to Starbucks to get a latte, out of those eight words, two of them are fringe, Starbucks and latte. The other six are all core vocabulary words. So if you take a look at the sentences that you say, you're going to see that the bulk of it is core vocabulary. But what can be hard is shifting our focus when we focus on nouns so much to using core vocabulary words in um, practical situations. So what I've done here is just taken some common lessons that come up from preschool age up through adulthood and taken a look at how we can make it more focused on core vocabulary. So the example here, we all know the book, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See, gets used a lot in preschool sessions. And a lot of times this book gets used to teach the animal words and the color words, which is great. We want kids to know their colors. We want kids to be able to name animals. But we can use it to teach so much more than that, too. 
I actually like reading the same book with different purposes in mind, especially with kids with special needs. This gives them the repetition they need, but isn't drill and kill. I'm a big fan of steering away from just holding up flashcards constantly and drilling. I want to actually make this more natural so that kids will be more likely to use these words outside of the therapy or classroom setting. Also, I would adapt the books with the child symbols or the adult symbols of, their, of his or her AAC system. Um, that way they can use the symbol but also see the text and that kind of can help foster those literacy skills as well. So an example of brown bear, brown bear. We know that it teaches color words and animal words, which is great. But we can also use it to say, I see A, and have the kiddo answer that. I see and A are all core vocabulary words. Or maybe they can ask us, what do you see? Or they can ask friends in the classroom or friends at their day program, what do you see? Or if you make your questions more open-ended, a lot of times that's all it takes. If you make the question more open-ended when you're planning um, an activity or something you're trying to teach, you have to answer with core words. You just have to. There's no way to answer an open-ended question without utilizing core vocabulary. So instead of me saying, pointing at the picture of the bear and saying to the child, what is this? And they say bear, if I say, tell me something about the bear. He is big. He is brown. I don't like. Maybe the kid is scared of the bear. Now, obviously, these vocabulary words have to be taught ahead of time. We can't just expect the, the child or adult to start using core words if they've never been exposed to them before. So as we're going through these lessons, we're assuming you're teaching some of those things. And again, have the child ask you or other children in the environment, what do you see um, outside of the context of that book? You know, maybe you can be doing a different activity and they can be the ones to ask, what do you see? Or again, switch it and the kiddo can be the one to answer that question for carryover activities. Next slide. This is a weather lesson and this usually comes up um, in schools, I believe in kindergarten or first grade. And these are some of the definitions kids are expected to know at that level. They're expected to know the definition for the word evaporate, atmosphere, precipitation, hurricane, condensation, and blizzard. Um, we have a question here. And I think that's a question to the group. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things um, for me, core vocabulary is, I think, definitely a better known concept for people who are in the AAC and AP world. But even then, I've still met a lot of SLPs or teachers or parents or AAC specialists who have been so focused on doing things a different way that this is kind of a foreign concept for them. Maybe it was something they learned before, but they've just you know, been doing things differently. Um, I've met quite a few people who have been in the field for a very long time that once they kind of hear this explained this way, will say, you know, I really need to change how I'm doing some things because you're right, my kids or my adults are stuck at just requesting and they aren't really doing much beyond that. Um, so I think it's just you have to keep yourself in the habit of doing it and stay in the mindset of focusing on core vocabulary. It's easy to fall back to just teaching nouns because I can go on Google and find a picture of any noun that I want to. <laughs> so it's easy to find symbols for nouns. Yeah, I didn't want to derail you. I just, um, we spent a lot of time looking at all no, the okay. AAC videos that we could find on YouTube and a lot of them showed people uh -huh. um, falling into some of the traps that you've described. Um, yeah. It's easy to do. And, and again, I think the simplest thing I can say when you're planning an activity or a lesson is try to make the questions more open-ended. And that's going to give you an idea of the vocabulary you need to focus on. Um, you know, again, when we talk about this weather lesson, for example, I don't know about you guys. Some of you may be big weather buffs, and that's great. Living in Southern California, I don't say a whole lot of words beyond sunny <laughs> or hot. <laughs> you know, I don't use the word blizzard very often. I don't really use the word condensation or hurricane. 
Um, so if I was using an AAC system and I'm someone with a limited vocabulary or maybe I have limited space on my device because of my motor issues or whatever it might be, these aren't words I'm going to put on there. But if we take a look at um, the responsive side, instead of telling the kiddo, define evaporate for me, and they have to, you know, define it. Or you read what I'll see a lot of times is the definition will be read by the teacher or parent, and then um, the the child has, you know, two or three choices on their board, and they answer evaporate. It's just not functional because they're probably not going to use evaporate much beyond that lesson. Okay, and we have a comment. Um, this is my first year in AAC and AP in my district. None of the teachers I work with knew about core vocabulary. I learned about it by doing research to gain knowledge at the start of the year. That's great, Amy. That's really great that you took time on your own to research that. And it's not uncommon, especially to meet teachers who, who this is kind of a foreign concept to, you, because most teachers don't get any sort of language development classes when they're in school. You know, I chose to go that route, so I had I was inundated with information. Um, but a lot of times they don't get that background. Which is funny because when you explain it to them and you show them the word list they're already using in their reading activities, then it becomes more clear and they start to understand it more. But in my examples here, you know, if I ask instead of reading the definition and having the child point to the answer, evaporate, if I teach them the vocabulary they need ahead of time, what happens when something evaporates? And they tell me something like what goes in air. Now I purposely did these not grammatically correct because especially when we're working with a lot of kids, they're not at that point yet where they're answering grammatically correct or they're using full sentences yet. So I'm doing the very basic here. And again, if we use the core vocabulary, now they have to demonstrate that they know the concept versus just something they've memorized. If they've just memorized it, when I read this definition, I point to this word evaporate, which is probably what they're doing is just memorizing. Now they've got to communicate the concept. What is atmosphere? They could answer something like air around us. Also, the words that I have printed in green are the core words. The words I have in red are more of the French words. This was actually an answer given by an adult when they were talking about, um, I'm sorry, not an adult, he was in high school. They were talking about global warming. And it was a teacher that I, I tried to go out and see as often as I could because her lessons were so well done to focus on core vocabulary. This was a high school student who has had his system for quite a while, um, but he's not grammatically correct. He usually answers in three to four word phrases, but he gets his point across. And when she asked him to tell her about a hurricane, he said, big turning storm, big storm that turns over water. He gets it. He's definitely demonstrating he understands the concept, and he didn't use the word hurricane or other big words to do it. You know, what is a blizzard? Lots of snow. Much easier than trying to read a definition of a blizzard and having the kiddo say blizzard. Okay, next slide, please. You know, or a five senses lesson. And this comes up a lot, and these are skills that kids you know, even adults use to this day. These are skills that we've all learned that we still utilize. Common words that are taught when you're doing a five senses lesson are the body parts. Eyes, ears, nose, hand, mouth. Now, body part words, we probably do want it on, on an AAC system because we want people to be able to tell us if something hurts or something's bothering them. And that's a common skill that we should all be able to have. But let's not forget the core words that can be taught here, too. We can teach the words see and look. We can teach the words here and listen. Smell, touch and point, taste. I love doing a five senses lesson. I've even done this with adults too who have never been taught these skills. Because you can do so many activities um, within the therapy or classroom setting and also in the environment to really make it more real to them. Now you can play I spy but use I see as the wording instead have a cardboard box and cut a small hole in it so that, you know, the, the person can look inside and tell you what they see and describe it. Bring in various things to smell. This is kind of a fun one to do, especially with people with special needs, because you can get an idea of, real quick of what they like or don't like smell-wise and what can bother them and trigger behaviors. 
Same thing with taste. We can figure out pretty quick what someone likes to eat or doesn't like to eat, what types of things they like, sweet, salty, sour. Playing different sounds and having the people describe them to you. They can tell you that's an awesome sound. I like that sound. I don't like that sound. Too loud, too quiet, etc. And bring in sensory items to feel. And they can talk about that too. Okay, next slide. You know, learning about the solar system, that's something that comes up, um, I think, in middle school in most cases. I'll be very honest, I don't know a whole lot about the solar system. Outside of what I was taught whenever I was taught it, I haven't used these words very often. So again, for me, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to have the planet names on my system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, etc. I'm probably not going to use those words very often. Instead, if you said, tell me something about Jupiter, I could answer, it's very hot there. It's the biggest one. It has a red spot. And now I'm using words that are pretty common to use. Tell me something about Mercury. Close to the sun, it's the smallest one. What is the sun? It's the big hot star. How does an eclipse happen? Moon goes in front of the sun. And now I'm demonstrating concepts about those planets rather than just labeling. You know, if I point to a chart on the wall and say, what planet is this? And the person's memorized it's Mercury. It doesn't tell me if they know anything about it or if they've learned anything about the material that's been taught. Again, open-ended questions or something like, tell me something about, elicits the core vocabulary response. You could also use this as a superlatives activity. You could use it to utilize the words big, bigger, and biggest, or small, smaller, and smallest. You could use that for a lot of different things. Okay, next slide, please. What about high school? A lot of high school kids have to take anatomy and physiology. And I've had high school kids using AAC devices with that's one of the classes they go to because it fits in the schedule or whatever it might be. Again, if we ask open-ended questions, you know, instead of um, reading a definition of the brain or something about the brain and telling and asking them which body part is that and then labeling it brain, what does our brain do? Helps us feel and think. And that, that whole sentence is core vocabulary words. What do we need lungs to do? Give us air, help us breathe. Tell me something about protein. Help me move and stay up. That was actually an answer given by that same, that same um, kiddo when they were talking about protein. It helps me move and stay up. He meant it helps him stay awake. <laughs> Define respiration. Air goes in and out or breathe in and out. What happens with your metabolism? Food breakdown. What is pigment? Gives me my skin color. So fairly simple responses, but again, demonstrating that they understand the concept. Next slide, please. Or how about adults? You know, what common activities do we all have to do, especially people sometimes with special needs? They need to be able to visit the doctor. We want them to be able to ask, why do I need that if the doctor's prescribing a new medicine? We want them to be able to say, my head hurts a lot, so they can tell a doctor they're having migraines or something. We want them to be able to say when a medicine makes them feel sick, so that they can get a different one. Or I feel sick because my head is hot, my throat hurts, and I have a cough or I hurt in my, and they can be able to name the body part where they're hurting. Pretty simple stuff, but again, I've met so many adults that have never been taught this that they can't do it independently, or it's a lot of guesswork to try to figure out what's bothering them. But they can tell you, I'm hungry, I want a drink, and that's about it. Next slide. Or even getting around town and traveling. You know, a lot of adults want to be independent. They want to be able to go where they want to, when they want to. So we want them to be able to ask, you know, in a new town or maybe a new bus route or a new bus driver, whatever it might be, I need help to find the grocery store so that they can get help. Can I get to the mall on here? Can they ask, you know, can I get to the place I'm trying to on this route? What time is the last stop? They know when to be back in time. I need to take this with me if it's something like their device or something that they need to take on the bus with them. I need to leave at 9 a.m. You know, I have a lot of adults 
um, in California to utilize access to public transportation. And they have to be able to call and tell whoever it is setting up the appointment when they need to leave or when they need to be somewhere. We want them to be able to communicate that. Okay, I have a video that just drives the point home a little bit more. But before we show that video, does anyone have any other questions or thoughts they'd like to share? I feel like I hear someone typing. Do people feel that schools are putting AAC ahead of academics? I'm asking that because I, my experience in the school districts is a little out of date right now, but uh -huh. I've seen kids where they spent, they were devoting equal effort or perhaps more effort to teaching academics as opposed to teaching communication, and the child graduated from high school probably knowing some academics, but not being able to communicate. I would agree with that. That's been my overwhelming experience. Um, and yes, please go ahead and answer yes or no. I, I do see that one person put no. Um, please answer what your experience has been. But that's been my experience, is, is that academics get put ahead. And again, oftentimes, I think it's because people just don't realize if they're teaching the core vocabulary and teaching communication, the academics will follow. You know, again, language precedes academics. If kids don't come in having that foundation of language and how to say things, they're not learn they're not talking to learn, and then it becomes a learning to talk type situation, and that can be a lot more tough. Um, you know, that's when you get into the trap of, oh, we're teaching about the planet, so I'm going to program a page of all the planet words that this child needs, but they're only labeling. They're not communicating that they understand the concept. Um, and outside of that lesson, they're not using that word. Or we get into, all we're doing is multiple choice. So the kids have memorized the answer they're supposed to pick, but they haven't really learned the concept of, of what it is they're supposed to be learning. So that's been my, my overwhelming experience. The good thing is, um, there is a group right now, and I wish I could remember who it is that's doing it, that's developing a um, curriculum for individuals with special needs. Because I know when I was teaching, that was the hard part. I didn't have a set curriculum that I went by. I had the common core standards that we used for grade levels. Um, but beyond that, it was a lot of developing my own materials. And if you're not someone who comes in with that understanding of language development, you do the best you can but you don't really realize that you could be doing a disservice to these kids. Um, there's also some free curriculums that are out there that do allow you to focus on core vocabulary. So there's, there's quite a few things available. Again, it's, it's becoming more and more of a push. So if you do Google searches, Amy you know, said she found out a lot researching core vocabulary on her own. The information is available out there. You just have to look for it and know that you're looking for it. This is a video that was put together by a group of individuals who all use AAC devices. And they're at varying levels. Um, I think it was a group of about five to six people. You can find it on YouTube. It's called The Language Dealers. It's free. It's only a couple minutes long. But just pay attention to the message that they're trying to get across, because it's just going to drive our, our point today home even more.
Okay, so again, when you're hearing it from people who use AAC devices themselves, it's hard to ignore. Um, it's a pretty big message from them. You know, and just a couple of things to touch on. You know, when the person walked up to the person using a device and said, hi, Michael, and all he had was nouns to say back, that sometimes happens with people using AAC systems, low tech, mid tech, high tech. Um, and, and again, just the other thing that we haven't talked much about it today, but we have to be willing to learn the systems too if we're going to, to teach it. You know, it's kind of like if you put a computer in front of someone, those of us who are in the AP world, and they can probably figure out a couple of things on their own, but if you don't show them and teach them, they're not going to have any idea all the things that it can do. So same thing with an AAC system. We have to learn it too and be willing to use it with them as well. We've got to be modeling to teach these words in this vocabulary to these um, people using AAC systems. Just a few resources to share, and again, I have several more if you need them. The AAC Language Lab is a website that has lesson plans, teaching materials, and PowerPoint books, and language stages charts. That's where I got the stages charts that I, I showed you earlier. This website is actually being completely revamped um, and, and will actually be better. I'm actually a beta tester for it right now. But right now it's free. Pretty soon it will not be. So definitely visit that and take some materials from it if you uh, feel they, they would work for you. The AAC Institute, they provide free, oh, sorry, free professional development courses. Um, those courses can be done at your own pace and they will provide you CEUs. So they'll actually send you a certificate of completion for taking the courses that they offer. Again, they're free. I think there's four or five different topics that are available right now. Tar Heel Reader, I'm sure most of us have heard of that, but I thought I'd list it just in case. It has free accessible books. You can load your own on there. It's kind of hard to sift through. Um, there's a lot there, and pretty much anybody can put what they want to on there. Um, but just take a look at it. I, I, I found it to be a good resource. Bookshare is also an accessible library. I'm sure most of us know what that is as well. The Bridge School in California has a wealth of information on their activities page. And then another document that you'll be receiving if you haven't yet is apps for teaching core vocabulary. You know, a lot of us are inundated with um, families and teachers and schools wanting iPad apps that are out there. These are apps that are great for teaching core vocabulary. And it's also noted in one of the columns, the language stage that it corresponds to. So you can kind of say, I have a child who's doing single words, so we're going to look at the apps that are for stage one. Or I have an adult who's using many more than that. Um, there are some adult apps on here. Most of them are more geared towards kids. And it'll tell you the language stage available. They're a range of free to 99 cents to a few dollars more than that. So there's a lot available here as well. This actually came from um, a friend of mine who updates it quite a bit. So again, take a look at that. That's a great resource because um, when you start looking at the apps that people are developing, there are a bunch that don't have any concept about core vocabulary. Right, there's so many out there. There's so many. Yeah, so hopefully this will be a good resource for you. You know, even the Make the Cookie app, <laughs> it can be fun because the child can tell you, you know, put that on, you know, make that. There's so many things on here that you can use that are really easy to use core vocabulary with the app. And fun, really fun. And again, most of them are free to very reasonably priced. Okay. So that is it for today. Again, I know we barely scratched the surface. Um, if you have questions, please let me know. And, and again, you've got my contact information here. You're welcome to email me for more resources or questions that you have. Um, I'd be happy to, to discuss this further with you. And it's, again, the email is julied at ocgoodwill.org. Thank you so much, Julie. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Thanks, everyone, for attending. I appreciate it.